I am Ashley Barnett. I am the president of the Iser Art Center, and this is Lexi Milliken, and she is our executive director. Hi. So we are here. We want to talk about Mary and Mary Yeiser and uh, all the things that she did to lead us to the point that we are today. She was born in 1905. So she came into the world with, you know, a lot of things were going on in the United States in 1905. The coolest for our area was in that same year, that's when the Market House building was built by her grandfather, David Yeiser Sr. So we are in one of the most historical buildings in Paducah. As from a child, Mary was always really enthralled with art from the very beginning. And she, you know, had the privilege of having weekly art lessons through St. Mary's um, Academy, where she, you know, went for many years. She is an alumni. And then that led her to pursue art studies throughout her entire life. She would go on to study at the Chicago Academy of Arts at the University of Kentucky, and she was fortunate to have John Rothstein, who later became the director of London's Tate Gallery as her art history instructor. Um, he encouraged her to go to London and wanted her to pursue some uh, classes over in Europe, specifically London. But for some reason, she chose Paris instead. Uh, we would love to know the reasoning behind that. But she went to Paris in 1928 on a ship at 18 years old, all by herself, which I feel is very, very brave. And she went over and, and studied at St. Tropez with noted German painter Hans Hoffmann. Hans Hoffmann is a abstract expressionist artist and is pretty well known for for that and um, among other types of paintings so as you can see that is a wonderful picture of the market building before it was enclosed and um, into what we see today when mary returned from europe in 1929 she came home to a very depleted United States. We were in the middle of a depression um, and it began to take its toll on the job market, but she still decided to stay in New York City. She wanted to be in the hustle and bustle of that art world and that cultural experience. So she took a clerical and sales jobs whenever she could, in addition to any other art related positions to support herself. She ended up attending an, an exhibition by students in a recent established school of tapestry weaving. And she really, really just loved all the textures and the colors that these tapestries had in them. She became acquainted with the school's founder, which was Giza Gilbert Folds. He was newly arrived from Hungary. So his English was not that great. And then transferring that his teachings over into English was a little bit difficult. So Giza and Mary arranged a deal she could get private lessons in exchange for Mary's help on writing a book on tapestry weaving, particularly French tapestry. You can access this book at the University of Louisville. It is also still available on Amazon if you have the money to purchase it since it is out of print. I think it's around $200. Um, or you can go to the University of Louisville's library and probably access it there as well. Um, due to the depression, the collaboration was, was short-lived. Um, however, Mary kept the manuscript and then she brought it to life and had it published in 1997 in collaboration with a grant from the Kentucky Arts Council. She made a, a video and a handbook illustration to go along with it. So to explain Fold's weaving techniques, I'd really uh, think that that would be an interesting video to watch. Around 1940, she returned to Paducah and she taught at the Paducah Junior College, which we now know as WKTC. She taught there from 1940 to 1942, and then again from 1953 to 1971. As you can see here, she's painting a lovely painting that I happen to own um, in my home, and I'm very fortunate to have it. She, as a teacher at heart, she was really frustrated by the fact that her students had nowhere to show their work and they had nowhere to experience art in person. And the reason that this really was frustrating for her, um, someone that really loves tapestries and we are a fibers community, there is so much detail and texture that you cannot capture in a photograph or a slide. Um, so she, she realized the limitations here, how this would affect um, her students' perception of particular pieces of work. So 
she realized that the only that she needed to um, to figure out a way to help the visual arts become more prominent in the Western Kentucky area, she just felt like it was gravely misunder underrepresented throughout our our entire region. And in 1957, the Paducah Art Guild was born. Mary, Miss Virginia Black. Bob Evans and Jerry Watson are just a few of the founding fathers. And the first executive director was Bob Evans. And their first meeting was held at the old Carnegie Library that we so dearly miss. Their first meeting had five paying members, $20 each, and one patron for $100 to give a startup budget of $200, which really amazes me that they were able to uh, um, start something with just $200. Freestanding wall boards were purchased for mounting for their exhibitions, and their first exhibition was supplied by the Smithsonian Institute which was a traveling um, tra traveling exhibition service that the Smithsonian Institute provided. The exhibit consisted of American wood carving from the National Gallery of Art Index of American Design. So that uh, we uh, currently still use some of those floating walls today. As you can see there's Virginia Black and that's a portrait of Mary that Virginia Black did. Each exhibition, one of the things that they started was a permanent collection and they did this painstakingly one piece at a time. Each exhibition, we they were, would purchase at least one painting, and this continued uh, on to create our permanent collection that we have today. Our permanent collection now consists of more than 452 works of American, European, African, and Asian art. Some of those pieces are Matisse, Goya and Maurice, um, which I'm a little bit more familiar with. Um, and the collection also contains the work of many regional artists, including Avery Krauts, Warren Farr, Jerry Watson, and of course, Miss Mary Iser. So in 1963, the Paducah Art Guild moved into its permanent home here, here at the Market House building, giving the Guild its permanent location. But as the years went on, um, one of the things that they uh, struggled with was flourishing memberships um, were, seemed to be a little bit complicated for them. And one of the things that they thought of was that the word guild was something that might be keeping people from joining the ISER, that it's not does not really show inclusivity. And so they uh, voted to change the name and a uh, to honor Miss Mary Yeiser, and they changed it to honor her and call it the Yeiser Art Center. Guild members just can the, the community of, of, of all over wanted to show inclusivity. And by changing the name, they could do that as well, but also they could honor Mary Yeiser, which really, really needed to do at that point. Um, she was much older in her age at that time. And I could see that they wanted to, to get that done while she was still living. The, dis the center has displayed upwards of over 500 exhibitions. Mary Yeiser, there's no way she could have understood the lividity of, of how far all this would go. I think that um, she would be really surprised to see where we are today. Mary passed away in uh, 2008, and she is buried at Mount Carmel Cemetery. As you can see, there she is. She's a very happy individual there. Um, a couple interesting facts about Mary that I think most people don't know unless they really knew her. I had the privilege of talking to her niece about a year ago for the kit, um, and her name is Lucy Yeiser Cooper. She lives in Florida, and um, she gave me a wealth of personal things about her that none of us really knew, that Mary, deep down, is a Cubist. She loves Cubism, um, which most of her work that I see is not Cubist. It's more uh, Expressionism. Um, she also was a fan of hats. She loved hats, um, any kind of hat, but I've never seen Miss Mary in a hat, so that's really interesting. So she definitely was a woman that saw a vision and saw that Western Kentucky needed these cultural experiences. Teachers nowadays, I think, realize the importance of having the proper classroom material in order to teach a student well. And when you do not have access to, to see something like a nice tapestry or a nice painting, um, you're going to miss a lot of the details and the textures through the slides and through just pictures in a book. So that was her main go, which I most definitely think she's accomplished that. Um, we currently boast around five, we, we currently have have hit the 500 mark 
of, of exhibitions of what we've accomplished in the 65 years that we've been in operation. That is something that we are approaching is our 65th year. And that is something we're really excited about and are getting ready to start planning a whole year worth of celebrations to devote it to her, what she wanted for this region and our community, and how important those cultural experiences shape and help us form a community that is more open and um, inclusive and provide a space that um, allows people to express their creativities in various different ways. So that is what leads us here to today. All right. Thanks, Ashley. I'm going to take over for just a few minutes. And Ashley's probably going to jump in here and there as I forget things. So the legacy that uh, Mary built has brought us to today. This is a current um, image of our gallery. So right now we have one of our international juried exhibitions, which is Fantastic Fibers, which I know that Mary would have loved. So Fantastic Fibers began in 1987 as a wearable art show and has evolved over the years to include a mix of traditional and non-traditional works created from all different kinds of fibers and work that addresses the subject or medium of fiber. So some of the artwork in this exhibition is actually made out of wire or plastic or other non-traditional materials, but it's still based in textiles. The Fantastic Fibers exhibition is open to submissions from anywhere in the world, and each year we receive hundreds of submissions. Um, this year, we included 74 pieces from 27 different U.S. states and four other countries, including France, England, South Korea, and Canada. So each year for Fantastic Fibers, we choose a new juror, and that way we get a different perspective from someone in the um, field of textiles. And that's why every year the exhibition varies so much. So I'm just going to take you through a few different Fantastic Fibers images. So we have work that is more of a um, traditional art quilt and then something that is made of plastics and thread. And we have artwork that, this is actually one of our artists from South Korea um, that has made this textile that looks like a type of snake skin. And we even have quilts that look like stained glass. So there's really a variety of different kinds of work that goes into Fantastic Fibers. And, you know, this is a show that draws quilters that are here for Quilt Week. It draws visitors from all, all across the country. We have a lot of the artists that are in this show actually come to see the show in Paducah from other states. And even this year, we've had artists that have traveled here for that. So there are um, three-dimensional pieces in this show. Not everything hangs on the wall. There are pieces that hang from the ceiling, artwork that's on pedestals. And of course, we have Lou Nelson. So one of our other international juried exhibitions is Art Through the Lens. And this is um, these images are from our Art Through the Lens 2019 show, where we could still have a lot of people in the gallery together. We haven't done that quite yet again. So a little bit about Art Through the Lens. Originating in 1975 as the Paducah Summer Festival Photo Competition, Paducah Photo has grown from a fledgling contest into an international juried exhibition. Over the past 40 years, this exhibition has, come, has become one of the Mid-South's most prestigious annual photographic events. As the exhibition grew and became internationally acclaimed, the name eventually became Art Through the Lens in order to better represent the reach of the show. So like Fantastic Fibers, Art Through the Lens received submissions from around the world, and artwork is chosen by a juror outside of Yeiser Art Center. And even though we have that international reach, we still have a strong representation of local photographers and photography clubs in each year's exhibition by carrying on the traditional the tradition of the regional showcase. So I think that's one of the things that makes Geyser Art Center really unique. We have a combination of local artists and international artists sometimes showing together in the same exhibition. And, um, you know, the artwork is... Um, on the same level, which is really amazing. Some images from this is the exhibition. Mm -hmm. This was uh, the award winner for that year. And then Lauren Chambers, these artists went on to become one of our jurors. So some, you know, more sort of traditional photography work. And then we have some, some different work in Art Through the Lens as well. So this is a piece by a local artist, Nikki May, who many people probably know well. Um, this actually had a wax coating over the top of the image so you know art through the lens might seem very traditional as far as a photography show but we end up with work that has many different variations of photography included in it 
So along with our, in, our international juried exhibits, we also have some annual exhibitions that we really love. Our, our members exhibition each year is really special. That's when we can highlight the members of the Iser Art Center who are artists who want to participate in this exhibition. So we get new members every year. We have members that participate that have been um, a part of the gallery pretty much since the beginning. So I think that's another really, a really nice combination of artwork with the younger artists coming in and the, the people who have kind of continued the legacy of the Iser Art Center through all these years. Another important exhibition that we did last year was an exhibition called Visible. So after um, the murder of George Floyd, we wanted to give a platform to the Black, Indigenous, and artists of color in our community. We thought that that was our responsibility. So we had an exhibition to highlight their artwork. And a couple of the artists pictured here, um, Desand R and Najar Abdul Musawir participated in the exhibition. The outreach that we received on um, that show was quite impressive. We had ind individuals that were coming from right outside Nashville, um, which one of them is uh, Mr. Lewis here. They were really impressed that we allowed this type of of art in a rural small community. He was really impressed that we 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 would accept this type of work. And that is what I feel is important for the ICER to do is to always be that beacon of light and to allow individuals who need a voice that we provide that voice. Because an art that is an extension of ourselves, it is an expression and it allows us to give everybody a different perspective that they may not be able to see on their own, but can see it through somebody else's eyes in their work. So I was really impressed with the uh, sculpture piece and had lots of different names that are usually associated with our African-American community. So, And as we move forward at the Iser Art Center, we want to make sure that we're being inclusive, not just saying that we include everyone, but really making sure that we're showing work made by all different kinds of people and really supporting people in different kinds of communities. So other ways that we do that kind of work are through um, different classes in the gallery. Sometimes we have classes that people pay for. Sometimes we have free classes. Sometimes we have classes for families or kids. Um, we recently worked with an artist named Susie Black. She taught some painting classes last summer and we're hoping to welcome her back here again um, soon when we can do some more classes in the gallery. Obviously, as Ashley mentioned, education was really important to Mary Geyser. So we want to make sure that we continue that legacy of the educational part of the mission of Geyser Art Center. So we also support our local artists and work with them often. A couple pictured here, Bill Renzulli and um, Char Downs and Jay Siska. We've done some different artist residencies and art sales, and we work really closely with a lot of our um, lower town artists and other artists that are in our community, and we love doing that. And then, of course, we work a lot with kids. We have kids classes and different um, events where we are able to let artists sell their work. So not just necessarily in the traditional gallery setting, but we have different pop-up events where artists can have their work available for sale and you know, help promote them in that way. And then of course, one of our very favorite things that we do here at Yeiser Art Center is the Lower Town Arts and Music Festival, which is held each May in the Lower Town Arts District. And that is a big festival that was started by the city. And then um, some of the local artists kind of took that over and eventually um, Yeiser Art Center ended up being, being the um, group in charge of the festival. So this is a six block radius in Lower Town where we have different stages of music and artists and food and drinks and just really a big community celebration of the arts in many different forms. In 2019, we had 20,000, almost 20,000 people that came to that festival. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty impressive that that many individuals um, love to come to Lower Town, see the homes, see the art, and of course, enjoy the music. And just some images of the stage and from the stage. And then because we've had so many challenges in the last year, um, especially with having a large public event, um, we're, we weren't able to have the festival last year and we're not able to have it this year um, but we're really excited to be able to have a different kind of event in the fall. Um, so we're hosting an event called the Oktoberfest, 
which is going to be held at Carson Park. And um, this is a ticketed event. So we're able to really be careful about social distancing and keep track of our capacity and numbers and also serve as a fundraiser for the gallery. So, you know, we're hoping that this is something that maybe we'll, you know, end up doing again. But, you know, it was really important for us to get back to doing a community-based event and still being careful and safe with concerns about the pandemic. So we have a really full um, exhibition calendar this year, even with the challenge, challenges we've had. Um, we have uh, Michael Tara is gonna be having an exhibition up next, and then we're gonna have some permanent collection work, of course, um, Art Through the Lens, and then one of our other favorite um, annual exhibitions, which is Teen Spirit. Um, Ashley actually served as the juror for that the year before last, yeah, I think. It's one of my favorite shows. You get to see all of this young talent that's getting ready to go out into the world and they're going to go off and some of them come back, you know. So it's nice to see what's blooming um, in our in our community. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites. Um, and two, um, I think it's extremely important for us to provide that type of space for these young artists, because it is a little bit nerve wracking to be in a show and to, to get that experience. So they're getting a little bit of that experience before they head off to college where it's going to be required as their degree for their degree. Yeah. And with Teen Spirit, um, we include students in McCracken County, but also in all of the surrounding counties. So we're serving a wide population of um, young people that might not necessarily have that opportunity in their community. Like Ashley said, they get the chance to have their work exhibited in a show. And a lot of these students are really talented and they go on to pursue the arts in some way, whether it's in college or in a different way. Um, so we really love being able to have all of them in the gallery and showing all of their artwork. And then we always end the year with our Wastelanders exhibition, um, which is a group of local artists. And um, we're happy to do that again this year. We normally have a big New Year's Eve celebration and um, we're not really sure what that's gonna look like this year, but we're just happy to be able to have their artwork in the gallery and to be starting to get back to a little bit of our normal programming. The membership um, exhibition is also one of the best exhibitions as far as getting a glimpse into all of the different artists in the community. It also provides us, that was also the space that I first introduced myself when I moved here um, in 2001, 2002, and I've been a member of the ICER ever since then. The nice factor about that um, exhibition is that you have various ages backgrounds, some that are self-taught artists, some that are very well um, established artists that have had tons of um, education in their field, but it also provides a space for you to show with some of your teachers. So that was the first show when I moved back that I got to experience what it was like to show with one of my professors, which was Mr. Paul Sasso from Murray State University. And that show was actually not a member show. It was a show just about 9-11 and dedicated to 9-11. And so those types of experiences are the extra little uh, cherry on the top of what we do. It's really um, um, important for those young artists to have those experiences with their teachers. And it's really a very beautiful experience to see that student become a colleague. Um, I got to see that in the Visible show too with uh, Ni Nigel and some of his um, um, students who got to show together. And that was one of the things that they had stated that that was the first show that they had got to show with one of their professors. So that's a really unique um, experience for those um, up and coming young artists. And I think um, I'm just going to riff on that a little bit. Um, one of the things that I didn't touch on um, that I think is nice for the community to understand is how we're funded. So our membership, you know, is one way that we are funded. And then we also have different community sponsors. So businesses and individuals that make donations or sponsor exhibitions, um, we apply for grants. And, um, you know, of course, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. So, um, you know, we do have some revenue through gallery sales, but we're mostly community funded. And that is why, um, you know, it's so important for us to be providing services for the community. So the things that we do, 
um, like our classes and activities for kids and families, um, you know, we see that as a really important part of our mission. Um, we're giving back to the community. The community helps fund us. And, um, you know, it's this really great circle that keeps going. If somebody would like to stop in and see you guys, what are your hours? That might so be. we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. And um, in the summer, sometimes we're open extended hours. Um, like if there's music at the gazebo downtown. Mm -hmm. So a good way to find that out would be um, on our Facebook or Instagram. We are currently um, rebuilding our website. It's almost done and we'll have that up really soon. Um, that was one of our projects um, during the pandemic that we've been working on is um, getting that updated and, and working a little bit better. So that'll pretty soon have those kinds of announcements. Mm -hmm. But the best way um, to to kind of see those um, things is through Facebook or Instagram. How many pieces of Mary Yeiser's work is in your collection? There used to be quite, quite a bit. Um, in recent years, some of them have been sewed off in order to make room for new artists, um, especially some of the, we had, we had duplicate pieces, pieces yeah. that were really similar. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I think now I would have to look at the exact, exact number. I mean, we still have probably five to 10 pieces of Mary's. Mm -hmm. We also, since, you know, since it is a fairly large collection, we're, we're lucky that we've always been able to find somebody to sponsor the space for us to store that. But in order for us to truly have a comprehensive collection of our community, um, it made sense to, to kind of sell off and, 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 and get the pieces that really need to be in that collection of Mary's, but also to be able to um, add to that collection. So they did go through quite a few of them and that's how I was able to obtain one of Mary's pieces. And actually a really interesting thing too, is we get a lot of people that reach out to us that have um, pieces of Mary's that end up donating them to the gallery. So Ashley actually has plans to go pick up a piece um, here in the next few days. We um, were um, donated a piece last year, a large mural piece of hers. Um, so those things um, kind of keep coming to us, which is really interesting because we learn more about Mary Eiser every time one of those pieces gets donated back to yeah. us. The mural is quite an impressive piece and it's really, un it's unlike anything that we have in our collection of hers. So almost surrealist in nature. So it was such a different for, for what we've seen and what we have in our collection that it kind of took us off guard. I can't wait to see the piece in Bardstown that, um, that I'm going to go pick up on June 4th. I'm hoping that it's um, a fairly sizable piece as well. And I think that's another thing that that just makes me think of another thing to bring up. Um, we get a lot of different kinds of requests at the gallery. So people that have artwork that maybe they want to donate or they're um, trying to figure out what something might be worth or they're looking for an artist that can um, do a certain type of commission. And we love those um, you know, requests or those questions. So we always welcome those. Um, you know, you can call us or email us with those questions and we'll try to point you in the right direction. So we work, like I mentioned earlier, with a lot of the lower town artists, but we also work really closely with the Art Guild of Paducah, the Paducah School of Art and Design, um, Maiden Alley Cinema, the Carson Center. So um, we can easily try to point you in the right direction if you have some kind of an art request. And then also, of course, if you're looking for, um, you know, artwork to purchase, or if you want to become a member, or if you, um, want to take some classes, even if it's not classes that we offer, we can try to help point you in the right direction um, to fill those creative needs. To answer your question, yes, Mary um, went on to um, live in Bardstown in the later years of her life. Um, she um, stayed there at a, um, I think it was predominantly Catholic seminary school along with a uh, retirement community. Um, she continued to paint on into her death, which is why I'm going there to receive that painting. But she is buried in Paducah. So if you, if anybody would like to um, see her, um, her grave is actually at Mount, Mount Carmel Cemetery. Um, we actually got a, a call from one of her relatives here recently. Um, and Lexi sh um, sent me the information and, and I contacted um, 
the, the, the relatives. They were coming here to celebrate their 50th anniversary. And they hadn't been to Baduka in quite some time. And they wanted to see where, how everything had changed. And they wanted to go visit Mary's um, grave as well. But um, yes, she did, she did go to live in Bartstown for just a short while. Um, but yes, she is buried here in Paducah. And I see there's another question. Are there any particular art styles or topics that you would like to see represented in the Geyser Art Center's collection in the future? And I would just say that, um, you know, to answer that, like, we're, you know, we're not always adding to the permanent collection, but as we are able to do that more and more, um, the most important thing right now, I think for us is to diversify that collection and make sure that we are representing um, all of the different kinds of artists that are in our community. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that was kind of the idea of our visible exhibition, just because you might not be aware of an artist that, that is working here doesn't mean that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. um, we have really talented artists, all different kinds of people, and we want to make sure that that artwork is represented here at the Iser Art Center. That was our best um, response that we could do at the time. Um, as far as um, inclusivity and um, diverse things, one of the things that the, the board and the mission of the Iser continues to do is to show that we are um, a welcoming space for any artist um, and that everyone has a space here. I don't, um, uh, younger artists were um, not participating uh, like they should, especially when I first joined the board. So it was quite intimidating to walk into a room with so much talent of individuals who had been homing in on their craft for 20 plus years. And I was a baby right out of college. So I was really fortunate to experience that and felt very welcomed by most of those individuals and um, I've came to know a lot of them over the years, but um, getting um, more indigenous and people of color involved and feeling comfortable and to show their work here was was somewhat difficult for the ICER. So the visible show has actually opened that door up a little bit, and um, we are getting to know more and more artists that I never even knew existed in this area, and I'm very, very fortunate. And I'll just add on to that. I think it was difficult in the past. I think yeah. now, like, that's not difficult for us because we know those artists and mm -hmm. we're working with them. And, um, you know, that's something that's not a, a challenge for, for us, us anymore. anymore. Our, our main challenge for the moment is, yes, we want to be able to show our permanent collection off on a regular basis. I think our, including in our mission statement, um, we will always be a champion for the visual arts now that we put on a large music festival in collaboration with, with the arts, um, we feel that it is imperative for us to promote any kind of creativity. So last summer when we saw what was happening amongst all of the nonprofits, especially in the art sector, it was imperative as, for us to try and keep Paducah creative. Um, that we wanted to see that everybody still has that spark of creativity and it's been astounding to see what everybody is putting in these shows since we opened the doors back again in January. There's a lot of social justice pieces that I would have never thought of, especially in tapestry work and fiber works. Um, but we had a, a, quite a few um, in the member show as well. So um, it's a really interesting thing to see that you can tell what's going on in the world and what people were experiencing over the past year. And this show really does show you exactly how much creativity that was there. So. We're hoping that someday we will have a second location so that we can show off our permanent collection on a regular basis and maybe collaborate with other organizations to do a more uh, comprehensive study of the different artists that we have in our collection um, in a bigger way. So. Yeah, and um, that made me think of something to add. Um, I think that it, it's very important to know that it is free to view our gallery. So you don't have to pay an admission when you come to visit. We do always accept donations. As I mentioned earlier, we're a nonprofit organization. So that's important for us. That helps us a lot. But you can bring a field trip in. You can bring a group from a senior center. Um, we work a lot with Easter Seals and have some of their groups come in. Of course, this is sort of um, pre-pandemic. So we haven't had as many groups lately, but um, if you ever have any kind of a group that wants to come in and visit, whether it's, you know, school or any other organization, um, 
you just give us a heads up ahead of time and we can usually arrange for someone to um, talk to them and kind of let them know a little bit more information about the exhibition. Sometimes we can plan a simple activity to do in the gallery, some kind of an art project that can be done. Um, we love that. I mean, that is, mm -hmm. that is one of the things that we really enjoy happening in the gallery is having some of those um, some of those field trips and different groups come in and that you you know you don't have to pay for that and that's also where the um, gallery membership <laughs> comes in um, to help support that for the community mm -hmm. so when you're a member of the gallery you know that you're helping get um, all those different people into the gallery and the cool thing about our membership is that we're part of the North and South Reciprocal Program. So if you have a membership to the Iser and you are going to go take a trip to Chicago or to the Frist in Nashville, which has wonderful exhibitions, and um, they recently did the Picasso exhibit. Mm -hmm. uh, they've done Frida Kahlo, which was really impressive. I got to experience that, and I got to see a Salvador Dali piece um, in person. Um, and so I can reiterate the importance of that um, because – in both of those exhibitions, I saw things in those paintings that I've studied for years. I'm a huge Frida Kahlo fan, but I never dreamed that some of the textures that were in her paintings were there because you cannot capture that in a photograph or a slide. So that was really um, an eye-opening experience. Um, I have a family membership, so my husband and I both got in for free at the Frist. Um, the parking, we were there all day. We did shopping outside and it cost us $8. That was it because I was a Yaiser member and they are part of that program. So it really, um, not only you keeping your exhibitions free here by having a membership, but you're also able to take that membership and use it in other cities when you travel, which is a really, really nice um, thing to do, so. Yeah, I've actually visited um, uh, museums in states even further away that I was surprised by that um, reciprocal program. So mm -hmm. there's a museum, the Orr O'Keefe Museum in Biloxi, Mississippi. I'm jealous. <laughs> that, um, that had reciprocal membership. And uh, so it's a pretty cool program. If you are someone who travels a lot and goes to other museums, mm -hmm. um, you know, you could maybe just have a Yeiser membership and get into some of those museums for free. So it's, it's a pretty great thing that connects a lot of different places throughout the country with. Um, it's definitely saves you money. If mm -hmm. you, if that is something that you enjoy doing and you do travel a lot, I recommend it because it will, it will save you a ton of money and admission fees. And, and sometimes it just gets you a discount, but um, any, anything would help. Um, and I think that in a, you know, roundabout way that sort of supports what Mary Eiser really was about, you know, with her traveling abroad to study art and, um, you know, coming back to her community. I think that's a sort of important thing too. You know, we really want to uphold the artists and creativity that's happening here, but then we also want people to be able to travel other places or, you know, see artwork here that is from around the world that they wouldn't be able to see anywhere else. Um, I think that's a really kind of unique balance that we're able to create here at Geyser Art Center, where we're, um, you know, we have local um, involvement, but then we also have this sort of broader reach. Yeah, Mary, Mary could never have realized just the cultural impact that she really was going to have. I think she was very wise beyond her years. I think she knew that that cultural experiences were not going to be um, available to everyone. I think she knew her status and her privilege in the world that it was a, a big deal for her to be able to go to Paris. Um, not everyone was financially capable of doing that, much much less brave enough to get on a ship at 18 and 1928. So um, she knew that she could needed to bring those cultural experiences back to her community. She knew the importance of how art affects everyone. And she also knew the importance of seeing something in person as a teacher. It's really, really difficult to teach textiles um, through a photograph. They need to be able to feel them. They need to be able to see the different textures and um, just the different ways that um, can, you know, th that the fabrics can come together. But I think in this past year, we all realized how important in person was. So that was our main goal coming out of the pandemic was just to get our doors open. And so people could come downtown and experience some art in person. They may not have been able to travel to other cities, but they could come and see some of our wonderful exhibitions 
and do it safely um, without leaving their hometown. So that was um, our main go at the beginning, which um, went really well. We've, we've, mm -hmm. um, um, we're, we're really pleased that we were able to open our doors as quickly as we did. So I think um, just in closing, I guess, before, you know, unless anyone has any other questions, um, I just want to say a big thank you to the library for letting us do this. Um, we really, um, we're just really happy, like Ashley said, to be back open and um, we're always looking for opportunities to work with people in the community. So please reach out to us and, and come see us, come see our exhibitions. We have um, a really, really beautiful downtown. A lot of other places are opening back up and, um, you know, restaurants have extended hours now. So I would just encourage everyone to come out and um, enjoy your downtown. You can just park and walk around and go down to the river. Um, there are other lots of other great arts organizations like us that you can go in and you know just look at artwork you can go to the market house theater you can go to the carson center you can go to maiden alley cinema you can go to the art guild um you can go to the papa gallery there are just like so many great things in our community so i encourage you to take um take advantage of that this summer and you know get free yeah get back out and you know safely enjoy your community and enjoy the arts and um please come visit us and reach out to us with any questions or you know if you want to volunteer or get involved somehow we would love to have we you love here. volunteers <laughs> yes <laughs>